kingdom of God on earth. In order for Jesus to arrive, you have to have a thousand-year kingdom of God on earth set up by man. Okay, now what's the thousand-year kingdom going to look like? Well, that's, of course, that's, a, <laughs> that's, a, that's been contested. It's a, it's, a, it's a little vague. But one thing is pretty clear, it has to be a perfect society. To be a thousand-year kingdom, people have got to be perfect. How do you get perfect people? Well, there are different ways of, there are different ways of going about it. And the Anabaptists in the 16th century you slaughter all the heretics. That was the way you get perfect people. The perfect people are defined as those who are followers of XYZ, the Messiah. They slaughter everybody else, you have a perfect world, right? Right. Okay, so this is. <laughs> uh, the, the, northern, uh, the northern Yankees they didn't exactly want to slaughter everybody right away because the immediate slaughter was sort of discredited from the 16th century on. But they wanted to do is to shape everybody else, stamp out sin. Fairly gradually. Gradually doesn't mean really gradually. It means like, say, in 50 years. 50 years is always a sort of a big post-millennial thing. In 50 years, we'll set up the kingdom of God on earth. And very early in the game, the North, the Yankees realize in order to do this, they have to have to turn the government to do it. You can't stamp out sin without government. Of course, the Yankees have always been a favor of government anyway. They're always itching for coercion. It was the Yankees that set up the first public school system in order to teach the kids civics and, and shape them up and teach them obedience to the state. So they were, they were primed for this anyway, and so they took to this as a duck takes the water. And the and Yankee evan, evangelical uh, uh, post-millennialism essentially was this, that in order to, first of all, you have to stamp out sin to set up a kingdom. Second of all, if you don't do your best, your damnedness to set up to stamp out sin, you too, you will be damned. You can only achieve salvation by, by maximizing the occasion for salvation of, of everybody else. This meant these people were very energetic fanatics, because they, had to do, you know, they wanted to be saved themselves, in order to do that, they have to try to save everybody else. <clears throat> if the other people don't like it, you set up a guillotine. You set up a sword of fire. Uh, according to the Yankee uh, doctrine, there were three, sin was very broadly defined. Uh, and the, uh, essentially, if you remember the old shadow radio, commercial, radio series, anything which, anything, anything which might, might cloud men's minds. So anything which might cloud men's minds so they couldn't achieve salvation has to be stamped out. Sin. The, the, the mind clouding was as follows. Liquor, demon rum, has to be stamped out. Obviously, liquor can cloud your mind, okay? <laughs> Whether it's permanent or not, it's another story. So liquor's got to be stamped out. Two, anything on Sunday except going to church and reading the Bible has got to be stamped out. Any Sabbath activities whatsoever. And Sabbath is often broadly defined as Sunday plus Saturday night to make sure nobody can enjoy themselves ever. <laughs> and... and uh, <laughs> And third, the Roman Catholic Church reports of the agent of Satan, the agent of the Antichrist. So these are the three major things that have to be stamped out. And the, the, the public policy on the state and local level and the federal level of the, of the, pion, of the evangelicals for a hundred years is centered on these, on these problems, these questions. Uh, on the state and local, well, on the immigration level, you try to keep out Catholic immigrants. Uh, they realize it's unconstitutional to do that, so they essentially they try to keep out immigrants, period, or else what they call Christianize the Catholics, have a public school system, a compulsory education to force the Catholic kids into the public schools so they can be Christianized, turn on the Protestants. The Catholic adults are considered damned anyway. Who cares about them? You get the kids. So that was the, on, the, on that, on the immigration front. On liquor, of course, you have to stamp out sin, stamp out liquor. <clears throat> and the Catholic Church, uh, me, and, and Sabbath activities. On slavery, it was also sinful because slavery interfered with the salvation of the slave. That was it. They, they, <clears throat> the abolitionism had nothing to do with human rights or anything like that. It was essentially a theological point. So, <clears throat> this was their activity of these people for 100 years, or 30 years until the Civil War. Uh, <clears throat> the, uh, now, of course, in this, in this coalition was first the Whig Party, and then particularly the Republican Party, which was founded as an evangelical party. The Republican Party was known throughout the 19th century as the party of great moral ideas, which means stamping out sin, of course. Okay using the government to stamp out sin. The Democratic Party was known as the Party of Personal Liberty, which meant they were favorable. The Democratic Party consists of everybody except evangelicals. Okay? In other words, Catholics, Lutherans, high church Lutherans, secularists, Southerners, and weren't part of this at all. Uh, in other words, everybody else who wanted to be left alone were, were Democrats. And the, and the high moral idea people, the crusaders of fire and sword of the Republicans. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> the, uh, in this coalition, so that's why the Northern War against the South took on a fanatical t- tinge to it. Uh, a cheerful willingness to uproot institutions, to crush, to kill, to plunder, to loot, to target women, as this Tom Plumby pointed out. Uh, all in the name of high moral principle and the perfect world coming up. That's why they, they can take the high moral ground. They, they're creating a perfect world, the kingdom of God on earth. The communists 
And they're, in their way, in the 20th century, quite similar. They thought they were creating a perfect world. Sure, you have to kill 30 million people. I mean, intelligent communists. Yeah, yeah. But it's, it's worth it to create the perfect world, a sort of atheist version of the kingdom of God on earth. So, uh, we had then the, uh, the Yankee fanatics were, were true Pattersonian humanitarians of the guillotine. Jacobins, Anabaptists, Bolsheviks, the whole bit. All in different forms and doing the same thing. Uh, and of course, then, now we find now we find the reason for the, the pseudo biblical phraseology of, of the northern of the Yankee culture of the, of the Battle Hymn of the Republic, you know, the, the, which summed up it says that a really blasphemous Battle Hymn of the Republic, which really sums up the secularized version of, of a sacra, a sacralized version of, of secular cause of making a purely secular cause into, some, into a holy crusade. That's a perfect uh, uh, evangelical doctrine, Puritan doctrine. <clears throat> uh, so the uh, modern, uh, modern left liberal historians put this in a slightly different way. Take, for example, the eminent abolitionist historian of the Civil War, James McPherson. Somebody mentioned him today, too. McPherson, in a recent book review, talks about, he, talks, he uses the Isaiah Berlin phony, art, phony distinction between negative liberty and positive liberty. But we're in favor of liberty, just we favor both negative and positive. Negative liberty means people like myself, in favor of the Bill of Rights, against, against the intervention, things like that. So he's what makes first positive liberties empowerment. <laughs> okay. So <clears throat> negative liberty, says McPherson, as I say, he means liberty. Negative liberty was the dominant theme in early American history. Freedom from constraints on individual rights imposed by a powerful state. The Bill of Rights, he goes on, is the classic expression of negative liberty, or Jeffersonian humanistic liberalism. These first ten amendments of the Constitution, he says, protect individual liberty by placing a straitjacket of shall nots on the federal government. Yes. In 1861, McPherson continues, southern states invoked the negative liberties of state sovereignty and individual rights of property to break up the United States. Unquote. Now, what was McPherson's hero, Abraham Lincoln's response? Lincoln, he writes, quote, thereby gain an opportunity to invoke the positive liberty, he means, of course, statism and semi-socialism, the positive liberty of reform liberalism, exercised through the power of the army and the state, the humanitarian with the guillotine again. To overthrow the negative liberties of disunion and ownership of slaves. And the interesting thing is, of course, McPherson says he's in favor of a blend of both. There is no blend of both, either one or the other. Of course, what he's really in favor of is reform liberalism. Another new model army at work. This, the Union Army is another new model army. Uh, so this is, uh, it, because it seems to me pretty clear the more the reform liberalism powers one group, the more you're interfering with the so called negative liberties of another group. The. Uh, <clears throat> It should be mentioned, by the way, that slavery is the, the southern United States is the only place in the Western Hemisphere where slavery was abolished by, this ter- by the terrible swift sword. Every other place in the Western Hemisphere it was abolished peacefully by peaceful compensation of the slaveholders. This includes the West Indies and in Brazil and every place else. So we, we did not need a civil war, a terrible, monstrous war to, to, get, to get rid of slavery. But we needed, if we wanted to have the Puritan millennialists at work, imposing a kingdom of God on earth by fire and sword and plunder. Okay, in the Republican Party, in this mighty coalition, we're more or less dedicated to this, this, this triad. There were different, there were different parts of the, different parts of the coalition, different people stressing different things. At the 18, at the fateful Republican Convention of 1860, for example, the major candidates for president were the two veteran abolitionists, William Seward of New York and Salmon P. Chase of Ohio. Seward, however, was distrusted by the anti-Catholic hotheads. He wasn't anti-Catholic; he was almost pro-Catholic. So he was distrusted by everybody else. So that was a kill him off. Chase, on the other hand, was very happy to play along with the anti-Catholic know-nothings. He loved them. Uh, on the other hand, he, made, he meant he would lose any kind of sort of moderate uh, German Lutheran vote. So he was distrusted by the Sewardites. So they sort of they knocked each other off. And a dark horse was nominated, Abraham Lincoln. And Abraham Lincoln was able to finesse the Catholic question because his major emphasis was on economic statism. He's an old-fashioned Whig. His big shtick with high tariffs partnership of government and industry, subsidies to big railroads, public works, all the rest of it, sort of a, a proto-New Dealer. So he was the compromise candidate, because the other people didn't care that much about the economic stuff, they were willing to go along with it. Abraham Lincoln, who was like it, by the way? The idea was a rail splitter, it's sort of like Bill Clinton being a heroic figure or something like that. But he, it's true, he used to be a rail splitter, I guess when he was 18 years old, but for, for his adult life, he was a big shot railroad lawyer. He was the, he was the candidate of the Illinois Central Railroad, the biggest railroad of the time. He was Mr. Railroad. <laughs> so, uh, and one reason for his victory at the convention was, for example, that Iowa railroad entrepreneur Grenville Dodge, this is one of my favorite stories about the Civil War, 
Uh, Randall Dodge was a railroad entrepreneur in Iowa. He helped swing the Iowa delegation in Lincoln. It was touch and go. In return for this, early in the Civil War, Lincoln makes him a general, 